working on chip-scaled atom interferometers. She then did her postdoc research at NIST in Boulder on chip-scale atomic devices. She has many years of experience in developing quantum sensors and instrumentation and is currently a lead physicist, physicist at Cold Quanta, focusing on quantum RF sensing and quantum communication. Thank you, take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be here today um, um, to share some of the things I learned in the past. And uh, before I started my talk, um, I actually like to acknowledge there are people that behind the scenes, particularly for Ori Johnson and uh, Diane Cards, um, they have been um, working kind of behind the screens to make sure all our webinar um, events can um, occurs uh, successfully, and uh, particularly today is Ori's birthday. So happy birthday, Ori. And with that being saying, so today I will be discuss um, some of um, my past experiences and my learning about the atom interferometer, particularly for the inertia sensing applications. And so I will first tell you a little bit about what is inertia sensing and what can they be used for. Um, and I will be, <laughs> quickly going through some of the conventional inertia sensing that you may or may not see um, around you. Um, in particular, I will discuss in a little bit depth for um, the inertia sensors that's uh, using the interference effect and particularly a few state of art was using the optical interferometer. And uh, at the end, I will um, kind of tell you a little bit about um, some of the work uh, in the modern content age using the atoms to do the inertia sensing. And I hope you, you can enjoy it, so, um, what I'm about to share. Um, so um, the picture on the right is one of the historical milestones that um, shows one of the example for the inertia sensing devices. It's a gimbal devices that was being used in the Apollo missions way back in 1969. It is a critical element that used to help navigate um, um, the, the space shuttle for the mission to the moons. So what is an inertia sensor? Um, an inertia sensor is basically a device or instrument that measures uh, the accelerations, the linear acceleration and the rotations of any object. And its application is actually very broad from something down to the consuming product um, like our uh, in, in our daily lives, uh, such as like watch um, or Fitbit. And there are inertia sensor in our cell phones these days, um, especially in the smartphone devices. And uh, the inertia sensor can have also the application for some very precision uh, position systems for the navigation in the defense and the military um, applications. Uh, inertia measurement unit that typically include both um, the, the devices that detect accelera accelerations as well as um, the rotations that's called uh, gyroscope. And sometimes including some of the main atometer too, um, like you know, in my little cars that um, usually have an indicator that tell me which directions. Um, and it has the six degree of freedom, basically measure the, um, the speed of accelerations as well as the rotation in all three dimensions. So some of the inertia sensing, which may or may not surprise you is um, a, a cover page on the uh, magazines about a year ago that um, saying the inertia sensor going to the Hollywood. And I think many of you are probably familiar with um, a lot of visual reality gamings and the movie industry that use the motion capture suit, which is basically a, a wardrobe that um, have many like inertia sensors integrated that detect a human movement and further transfer the information onto a media like computers. 
And so people use it to make video games, animated movies, um, as well as um, for the gaming systems uh, like Oculus Quest and so on. The inertia sensor is also everywhere in our cars. In particular, there will be an inertia sensor used to detect the collisions and the crash to release the airbag. And for the modern car technologies, uh, for the autonomous vehicles that um, inertia sensor can help to define the data positioning, especially in the circumstances where the communication got interrupted and there is no GPS um, receivings. And for the inertia sensors, you know, down to our daily life, some of you might have the smartphones, the Fitbits, and this um, like on my iPhones, there is a little activity apps that can tell me how many steps I take. Um, those are the great example for how well the inertia sensor that's integrated and impact on our daily life. And furthermore, the inertia sensor also have the application in the medical industry um, to help with rehabilitation and uh, the health monitors. So for the inertia sensor that is typically in the consuming product, the focus is on the small sizes and low cost. They are also the higher ends of the inertia sensing um, sensor devices that mostly using for navigations and for defense or space applications. Um, like I mentioned before, the inertia measurement unit consists of both accelerometer and the gyroscope and interfacing with the, some of the GPS signal and have a small computer on board, one can make a very precise uh, inertia navigation system that could be using under the water, on the surface of Earth, or even out in the outer space. So this is a summary to compare various inertia sensing technologies and uh, um, this is, was taken from the journal in the IEEE's about two decades ago. And the breaking into two categories of inertia sensing technology, one is the gyroscope used to detect rotations, and the other category is the accelerometer used to de detect the linear accelerations. So there are typically few type of uh, technology used. One very common one is the MENS devices. MENS has the advantage of the small size and the low cost. Um, so those are the micromechanical devices that showing um, on, on, on the plot. The higher end gyroscope typically is using the optical interferometer as the concept, that including the fiber optical gyroscope and the ring laser gyros. And they are some relatively new technology like um, HRG's, um, the mechanical type of resonator, which I will give you a little bit more details uh, later that uh, promotes uh, very high performance and very high precision. So a couple examples of the electromechanics and the, some of the audio generation of the, the micromechanical devices, including um, the mechanical structure that use our torsional force and uh, the micromechanical men's devices, inertia sensor typically have some sort of resonance structure like the tuning fork um, or, or pendulums. And the operational principle is um, when there's a rotations or accelerations, uh, it will be offsetting those resonance structure like the tuning fork and the pendulum's position. There is usually a compensating mechanism to allow detect what the, the, the offset is and, and compensate for the inertia force, therefore can read out um, um, the accelerations as well as the, the rotations. One of the recent technology that promotes much higher sensitivity is the hemispheres um, resonators. Um, basically, it's a quartz structures and the shape into um, kind of like wine glasses. Um, so 
the, the operational principle is the vibration standing wave. It would be excited in those um, hemispheres resonance structure. When the rotation occurred, then this, the two standing wave would have um, a, a phase shift due to the Coriolis force. And that's why the rotation could be detected, you know, up on um, the, the angle differences um, introduced. So with that, I will slowly move to um, a little bit um, into the concept for how other type, particularly the optical gyroscopes um, works. So in the optical gyroscope, there is an effect called Saniac effect. In the Saniac, uh, in the optical um, interferometer, which is um, um, shaping into a ring, um, a closed loop, typically there will be optical wave going in both directions. When a rotation occurred, um, the, the two optical wave going in the opposite directions will have a phase shift due to, which is proportional to the rotations. And this phase shift can be detected to extrapolate um, the external rotations. And two typical examples are the ring laser gyros and the fiber optical gyros, which both have um, um, the photon and enclosed um, optical wave that go in both um, prop, uh, pro, uh, clockwise and counterclockwise. So the phase shift in this case is proportional to the rotation rate as well as the enclosed area. The big it is, um, then of course it's more sensitive. And one of the reason that fiber optical gyroscope wing out is because we can loop the fibers uh, many times and then there is multiple factors um, increase the enclosed area in this case. Couple other optical interferometer examples, including um, the LIGO, which some of you may see uh, the, the news article coming out a couple of years ago that it is a enormous uh, project that built the laser interferometer across a 300 kilometers um, kind of lens scape to detect a gravitational wave. And uh, we also have a similar project out in space, um, which is called the LISA programs, also utilize um, the, the laser interferometer concept um, to detect the gravitational force. So going down to, um, you know, going away from the optical interferometers. Next, um, I'm gonna tell you what's the difference. So the quantum interferometers, uh, quantum inertia sensors basically using a very similar concept of the optical interferometers. Um, in the quantum mechanics, there's so-called wave particle dualities, meaning that every single particles or every single entity have both um, wave um, property as well as the particle property. Just like how we usually see the light, we consider it's a, a optical electromagnetic wave, but it also have its quantized natures that um, can be present as a photons. A particle is um, it's the same way um, in 1922s, um, De Broglie uh, discovers that each individual particle can also um, have a wavelength that is defined by, um, you know, its momentums. So the De Broglie wavelength usually is inverse proportional to um, the, the optical, um, it's inverse proportional to the momentum of the atoms. And some of those details were actually covered by our previous webinar. So when we consider atoms uh, without the external force, based on its velocities, um, it has a certain deployed wavelength. When an atom moving 
in an envir environment that has external force, such as gravity, atom would tend to slow down if it travel against the gravity. For example, like when you go upward. And in this case, once the atom slow down, so the de Broglie wavelengths enhance, uh, increases. So one would see a dispersive in, in terms of the, the particle wavelengths. So similar to the optical interferometers, basically a concept for the free space interferometer um, using uh, the very similar concept um, with the wave nature of the particle. Um, so using the atoms for the interferometers, um, that has advantage of um, a scaling factors. So in the quantum mechanics um, and the Saniaki effect, basically consider each individual uh, particle of atoms that has a great enhancement of up to 10, 11 order magnitude compared to the photon in terms of the, the interferometer um, Saniaki effect. It is hard to come up with the same atom flux, just like the photon time, at least not today. But overall, so the atom interferometer still presents some of the performance advantage. Besides, um, the interferometer geometries, um, depending on how those um, optical pulse the sequence um, they use for beam splitting and um, reflecting the atoms, that has many more flexibility that we can place. Uh, one can configure to detect both accelerations as well as rotations. The free space interferometer in this case is the same as the optical interferometer. So its sensitivity is proportional to the enclosed area. That's why it's very size dependent. And the principle of those atom interferometer rely on um, a way to create and split the, the wave um, package. And one very common way to, to do is to use the so-called the stimulated Raman transitions. So similar to the optical beam splitters, uh, for the atomic beams, one use um, a two frequency light pulses to create a standing wave acting as a gratings. When the atom pass through those, um, those optical gratings, um, that it will go through uh, what's so-called the stimulated Raman transition process. So it is a process upon absorbing a photon, gain some momentum, and then stimulated emit um, another photon and further gain another momentum from um, the photon. So as the end result, um, in some of the process, or like some of the atom will be gaining the two, two photon momentums. Um, and by controlling the intensity and um, also the pulse width during the process, uh, one can control how much atoms that um, kind of go into the different internal states and um, some of them will gain the two edge bar momentum while the other one uh, would not. And it's all depending on the light pulse width and the intensity. So by playing with those two parameters, one can have a 50-50 beam splitters, and one can further make um, what we call the pie poles, which act like optical mirrors to bounce the atom back. And uh, then upon recombining, um, then we read out the face of the two wave package. If there is external force present um, during this sequence, then there would be a phase shift introduced due to the rotation or linear accelerations. Um, and so that's how the free space atom interferometer works. And in some of the configurations, the acceleration sensitivities, which is proportional to the inter uh, the, the square of the interrogation times, meaning how long the atom travel um, before it got detected, before the phase got read out. In the gyroscope uh, geometries, some of the, um, the, the phase shift and the, thus the sensitivity is very similar to the optical gyroscope that is proportional to the enclosed areas.
And here is the tables that um, kind of summarize how does the free space atoms interferometer compare um, to some of the other existing technology. So the, the work for the free space atom interferometer has been carried on for uh, more than two decades. And one can see that um, in, in terms of the gyro configurations, the um, atom interferometer has pretty attractive performance in terms of the sensitivities um, compared to some of the gyros or other, other competing technology like nitrogen vacancy center um, for this report that published in 2020. Couple of uh, laboratory published laboratory um, example for the atom interferometer um, are the the picture that's showing on the right that kind of give you the sense on the the size scales and uh, um, it is actually um, you know the effort is uh, occurring in both the U.S. Um, and Europeans and everywhere. So, In the long term, um, this is in one of the IEEE sensors uh, reports um, that the atom interferometer, like showing previously, that some of the work demonstrated already project very promising performances. So in both the gyro sensitivity and the atom interferometers that um, the, the quantum inertia sensing can really um, having a, a great impact, especially for the, the market at the high end um, that require the, the high performance. Couple of the advantages that the quantum inertia sensing that really present is it's a low bias drift and the, the high scale factors stability that I mentioned prior. Besides, the atoms are universals. So usually one atom is very similar um, and almost identical to the others. So with the atom interferometers or some of the atomic devices, oftentimes it has the self-calibrated feature that um, because they will perform almost identically from one to the others. So there is minimal calibration required. And uh, furthermore, going from free space to some potentially um, guided atom interferometers, um, the atomic, um, the atom confinements can also in, um, enable and uh, reduce some of the limitation in terms of the free space geometry and allow the inertia sensing uh, work in a high dynamic environment. And many quantum technology these days has been taking a one step beyond that in a lot of classical um, sensing devices, the performance is typically limited by the ultimate signal to noise ratios and ultimately it's a so-called quantum projection limit, which is um, scale as one over square of N. Um, N is the, the number of the atoms or the number of the photons. But utilizing some of the quantum phenomena such as uh, spin squeezing, that one can even push these limitations beyond um, the current classical limit. So in the second half of my talk, I will kind of um, going through some um, overviews of the existing atom interferometer used for various applications. Um, one particular example is, um, is the, the graviometers they made um, with the atom interferometer towels. So two examples that um, I, I listed here are one 10 meter towels that's uh, built in Stanford University in US with the other ones that was the work that carry on in Hanover. Um, both have uh, a, a tall structures, roughly about 10 meter high, and using the free space um, interferometer ideas um, and the long interrogation time as well as the 
um, to improve the sensitivities and the test is some of very uh, fundamental uh, physics principle, equivalent principle, um, which is the, the, the gravitational force. So in the Stanford work, it was a combination compare both rubidium-85 and rubidium 87s, and the resolution in their um, graviometer designs, um, it's been pushing down to 1.4, 10 to the minus 11 Gs, which um, is pretty comparable to um, some of the state-of-the-art um, competing technologies. And the handball will work um, using the different species of the atom, also achieve a sensitivity of less than 10 to the minus, 10 to the minus nine Gs in this case. And both um, gray sensitivity come with, um, you know, its size in this case, in the free space set up. And another interesting example, it is a IMU that was made um, in the 30s. This is an example that illustrates uh, the flexibility and the geometry that one can play to with um, atom interferometer. So in this case, a simple atom was, um, atom clouds was launched um, in an angle trajectory. They were three pairs of um, the, the Raman beams, um, which was the, the grating structure we see previously um, in all three dimension. By controlling the timings um, and the sequence um, and which pairs of the Raman beams that are turning on and off, one can alter the atom trajectory in all three dimensions. And uh, in the picture on the right, there were four different configurations and the four different trajectory that was tested and has a different sensitivity as it was labeled that um, it can both detect the rotation and the accelerations in X, Y, Z, all three dimensions, just by playing with all those beam um, geometries. Um, in this case, they also have the interrogation times up to 80 milliseconds and uh, um, it's allowing all six degree of freedoms with the performance um, that was demonstrated um, with um, rotation sensitivity at 10 to minus six radian per second. And some of most of the free space atom interferometer that I mentioned before typically use it's operating in the pulse mode. So um, referring to some of our previous um, um, co-contest webinar, um, there is a sequence to prepare and make the co-atoms um, assembly as the atomic source for those in atom interferometers. Um, different from those poles, atomic source, there could be a different configuration to provide atomic beam, which is the CW source. And uh, uh, this work um, that use the core atom source um, that was injected continuously from a mod um, that was shooting through uh, similar three beams, uh, three Raman's um, transition sequence. And the advantage for the CW source in this case is to allow enables the high bandwidth and the high dynamic range for the work. So switching gear a little bit is um, um, slightly different from the three uh, Raman beam sequence atom interferometer. Uh, interesting work carried by NIST. Um, um, using um, the atoms of free fall and expansion, which it's called the point source atom interferometers. So this is an interferometer that has um, a multiple dimensions of sensitivity up on the single snapshots. Um, the way it work is to have the, the, the atom source that drop and expands rapidly due to gravity 
while shining um, those Raman poles or interferometer poles along the longitudinal axis instead of the transverse. And the, the detection would be um, imaging on the whole cloud. Because the way the fringes work, it has um, the two dimensional information. So going using some of the signal processing techniques such as principal component analysis um, that one can extrapolate more than just um, one inertia sensing degree of freedom uh, for the one snapshot. And um, it is actually a very interesting idea. The only limitations in this scheme um, is the interrogation times and also the atom expansion velocity. Atom expansion velocity can add systematic errors um, that need to be calibrated. All the above examples were the examples of the free space interferometer. They has been a focus and interest in the guided atom interferometers. So one example was um, um, guiding the atom using the magnetic wave guides. This has been the effort that um, that's ongoing for decades and they are technical challenging, but with the circular magnetic waveguide structures, one can have a large um, enclosed area comparable to the free space time or even larger. And combining the magnetic waveguide with the optical interferometer, um, this work have some projected um, sensitivity that is also down to 10 to the minus nine radius per second for the gyroscope uh, performance um, due to its enclosed area. For the guided atom interferometer, it also have the advantage of um, it's more swap friendly because um, with the free space one, the, the splitting angle is typically very small. So, the free space interferometer achieving the large enclosed areas is typically by um, kind of propagating the atoms through the long distance. Besides the typical Raman transitions, um, there are other means, um, optical means to split the atoms. Uh, one example was also the work that I involved in collaborations um, with um, Harvard University years ago that using similar optical um, poles to split the atoms. Um, it is um, innovative um, two poles schemes where it doesn't, unlike the stimulate the Raman transition, it doesn't really involve any internal states change, but the atoms splitting ratios um, is also very high, um, has a very high efficiency in this case. And uh, with, you know, um, some of the work that done at CU boulders in um, Dina Anderson's lab, that proof um, the shaken lattices is also another way to split the atomic wave package with the optical means. So um, in a standard optical lattices configurations, um, the atom will be trapped in, in the potentials that are formed by periodical atomic potentials. When one starts to modulating the phase or the frequency in these optical lattices, then the wave package's phase get manipulated and thus it, it would um, gain the momentum and, and um, can make the beam splitters for the modes uh, interferometer with a very similar concept. By playing with um, the phase and the frequency of um, this modulated potential, one can one can also make the uh, a linear um, accelerometers as well as the gyroscope in two dimensions with proper configurations. Oops. 
So the, the Shekin lattice is a configuration confined gyroscope has very similar um, advantage that supported the high dynamic range operations. Some of those um, optical potential using uh, very high power lasers um, can support up to 10 to 100 Gs um, um, dynamic environment and still remain trapped. And the atom trajectory in this case is manipulated through um, with just the, the frequency and the phase that imprinting thing onto the, the laser system. So um, one can play with um, different trajectories without any substantial hardware reconfigurations um, with the two dimensional potentials. At the end, uh, one thing I'd like to bring up is when considering um, the, the atom interferometer as the inertia sensing applications, um, typically for the core atoms, it's operating in the pulse mode in general because there will be a time required to prepare um, this core atom assembly, um, except for the situation where one uses the atomic beams. However, um, with those atom interferometer that projected very high sensitivities, because it's post mode natures, that in some of the application, it was considered to combine with um, other um, technologies for, for the inertia sensing. One um, theoretical effort that shows when those um, high performance inertia sensing operating in the pulse mode, its performance highly depends on the duty cycle of those inertia sensors. And uh, the, the plot um, showing on the left is when it's running 100% duty cycle, um, the performance, the position arrows that typically it's order magnitude better when running at a new node low duty cycle and combined with the other technology. So with the atom interferometer, one challenging ahead would be to figure out um, how to operate the sensors in the zero day time with the zero day time or um, mitigate it with some sort of continuous source um, um, co-atoms development and I guess with that, I will be conclude um, kind of my, my talk for today. And, you know, I'm welcome some comments and questions. All right, Ingju, it sounds like uh, we have some good questions in the Q&A box. Uh, remind folks that if you have questions, pop them in there and we'll, we'll ask Ingju live. Uh, the first one is from Erhan who asks, could you please explain how the matter wave property of cold atoms plays a role in atom interferometry? Um, sorry, uh, Sesi, can you repeat the question? My internet just broke off. <laughs> of course. Can you, can you please explain how the matter wave property of cold atoms plays a role in atom interferometry? Oh, so um, I guess I didn't get into much of the details, but basically, um, like I mentioned, the, the De Bois wavelengths of the atoms is depending on its momentum. And in, um, so nominally, when the atoms are hot at the room temperature, the De Bois wavelength is very short. And also it has a large um, thermal distributions. Uh, basically it's a Boltzmann distribution that describe um, the wavelengths of the atoms at the room temperature. Once we start to apply the technologies that um, such as laser coolings or some evaporative cooling to cool the atom down to microkelvins or even like hundreds of nanokelvins, then it become much more coherent so one analogy that people like to um, use is 
we typically have those light bulb, those are the white light source. And then we also have the lasers. And when one consider doing the, the optical interferometers, um, laser is often used because um, it's coherence property that um, every single photon has more, less diverse disperse of its wavelengths. And the, thus the phase, um, it's, um, it's, we can more accurately de um, determine the phase shift. And atom is the same so, um, compared to the thermal atom, the core atoms um, has more coherence property, meaning all the deployed wavelengths more collide and um, uniforms. So the sensitivity is higher. Otherwise the face would easily get washed out if there's a, a dispersion. Gotcha. So he has a follow-up question, uh, which is, so is it really necessary to consider the de Broglie wavelength of atoms for interferometry? And it sounds like from your previous answer that yes, it, it really has to do with the wave nature and being able to read out the phase. Is that correct? Yeah, so I, I think um, basically it is for the atom interferometer to read out is indeed a phase. So um, it is really kind of the, in my view, it's, um, it's really the wave property that carry out um, the, the performance and also the functionality. Great, thanks, Andrew. In you, we have another question from Howard. Um, his question is, what technique do you use to separate linear acceleration sensitivity from angular sensitivity in a cold atom gyro? And I guess that's in regards, uh, you can get dual use where you can sense both the, the rotation and the acceleration in the same interferometer. Yeah, so um, I mean, one, one of the, the easy configuration is, for example, um, in the configuration I show here is um, if one can just um, duplicate it, but instead have, um, you know, so the figure that I show on the screen right now, um, that has the sensitivities. Um, if we look at the, the face differences between the two arm, that has a direct sensitivity in terms of the accelerations. If we were launching the atoms from the opposite directions, then we can have, you know, basically totally uh, uh, arms that where the atoms would be sampling through a closed loop. And by having two sets of those atom interferometer but one is counterpropagating than the others. Looking at the phase outcome by adding or subtracting that one can get either acceleration or gyroscope. Cool, thanks. Um, I guess uh, we'll move on to the next question. Yeah, it sounds like we've got a good question from Zhang Min Li. Uh, he's asking, what is the main direction of cold quanta in terms of atom interferometry? Uh, we have atom techniques. So are we working towards magnetically guided atom interferometry uh, or is it something else? So right now our current focus, it's more on the, try to guide the atom with the optical means. And in fact, it's more um, in conjunction with the shaken lattices approach that we are currently taking. So with my PhD and my previous experiences, they are a limitation, mostly engineering um, resolutions. Um, those magnetic wave guides, uh, um, it require, because the atom, atoms are so sensitive to the environment. One of the challenging I, I faced in the past was for example, the microfabric structures uh, for carrying the current, it's not as smooth as it need to be. So by creating the magnetic waveguide itself, it actually created a lot of um, variation in terms of the magnetic potentials and atoms are just very sensitive to those. So it adds a lot of um, noise in the background. Um, 
for the interferometric uh, functionalities and the performance. So optical, on the other hand, um, the laser technology has been um, very mature and advanced. So it does have a, a new turn of advantage to create the more smooth and better control potential to manipulate the atoms, in my view. Great. So currently with co-quantile, I think we are more taking the optical approach for the guided interface. And a little bit, a little bit of a follow-up to that is, um, what do you expect the data rates of uh, these interferometers that use BEC atoms uh, is? Is can you give us uh, some values that you think we can achieve, and uh, what kind of a practical rate that would be necessary for some applications might be? Right, and right now I would say so. Even with co-contact miniaturized um, co-atom apparatus, we are typically running at the rate of one hertz, and of course, this one hertz is nowhere, um, you know, near what what's desired in most of the environments, such as the aircraft and stuff like that. With the co-atom approach, but not ultra cold, meaning like not condensate, but just laser cool. I believe the rate, uh, the rep rate uh, could be improved by probably about one order of magnitude or slightly higher. However, they are technology area that um, I, I think one should be really focused on. For example, um, it is a challenging topic like CWBCs. Um, once we, those technology, um, become possible, so they would really open a, a, a door to make um, those um, atom interferometer has a, a huge impact. But in the near term, the, they are alternative to work around. It's less ideal, such as um, one can always multiplexing the interferometer to make up for the, um, for the dead times. Um, the duty cycle and the bandwidth, um, there is always a trade-off with the atomic beams configuration. One can achieve maybe higher bandwidth, um, but it, it always comes with a price with um, performance reduction. So when we consider um, what to make, I would say it's very application specific, but there are a few workaround trick that we can play. Thanks, Jim. All right. Um, uh, this is a good question, uh, specifically as it relates to kind of the shaken lattice technique. And uh, uh, the person asked, could you talk more about the comparison between the free space atom interferometer and guided atom interferometer? Um, so I, I would say, you know, um, the pro and cons, the, the advantage is really, in my view, is in the dynamic range. Um, with the free space interferometers, the sensitivity comes with the size. However, one can imagine in the, in the free space configurations, if it's operating in a high G environment, um, atom has no confining force, then um, a, a shake or a spin can really make for example, like atom fall out of detection area. And that's why it's not suitable for um, some of the high dynamic environments. With a guided atom interferometer, because atoms are basically trapped and guided, they can only go to where we want them to be with the guiding structure. So as long as the guiding force, such as the optical potentials or magnetic potentials, it's strong enough one can really imagine that um, the atom can follow the desired trajectory up to, you know, multiple Gs, 10, 100 Gs environments, giving the sufficient um, confining force. Um, the downside is that um, atom is a very sensitive subject. So when one try to do the guided interferometers, those confinement come with some external force. And of course, one have to make sure those, those force, such as optical dipole trap or magnetic potentials are, are well under control. So any noise 
or any you know, variations would easily disturb um, the outcomes um, because Adam cannot tell apart what would be the, the desired detecting force or, um, or the difference between the change in terms of the guiding force. So of course the challenge in come with the guided editing interferometer is a much better control in terms of, for example, like light intensity um, and the frequency and so on and so forth. Sure, th thanks. And they have a follow-up question. Um, which one do you think will go to practical use? Um, I would say the, the research in the um, free space data interferometer um, has got a hand start, head start and uh, it has been um, kind of um, in actions for decades. Um, in the near term, it show many attractive um, and the positive um, performance demonstrations. Um, ultimately, I would think, you know, years from now, the hope is that we can figure out a way to perform the guided interferometer because um, looking at the, the fog, the fiber gyros, looking at the laser ring gyros, um, one, out, eventually in terms of the application, one would need one, the small sizes. And the only way to really achieve the small sizes and, uh, you know, superior performance is through the guided configurations. So um, I would say the near terms, uh, it is easier to pull off a free space interferometer, but ultimately um, in the long term, they are hurdles that we need to um, continuously work on um, to try to guide the atom and the control and the manipulate them. All right, thanks. Yeah, lots of good questions here. Uh, so and the next question looks a little bit towards uh, what Cole Quana is aiming to do, uh, specifically uh, building miniaturized inertial sensors for real world applications. Uh, are we, we working towards that or more working towards detector sensitivity? Um, so, I mean, currently Cole Quanta's strengths is, um, um, you know, providing, so for, for the past decade or two, CoQuanta has been facilitated to provide the enabling technology for any quantum research and quantum technology developments. So our strengths is in addition to the currently quantum computer efforts, our strengths is um, it's to fabricate the hardware and the platforms that would enable all those quantum technology. When you're looking at the interferometer, when you're looking at other te uh, quantum technologies, um, they share a very similar um, common grounds, it's my views. So co-atom as a base and um, little add-on technology like optical analysis, um, which could be used for interferometer um, and the, 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 the guided, the atomic width guides, but also for the clock and the, um, you know, many other different applications. Um, in my views that co-quanta's focus would be really focused on advanced, um, those fundamental enabling technologies but with the mind that it could cover many different applications. Um, basically one platform with the small tweak, um, they can branch out um, to adapt for different usage. I, I think it's one of the, the ideal cases. Okay, thanks, thank you. Looks like we have uh, enough time for one more question. Uh, sure. Um, 
So this question is from Julian. What is the phase performance of the interferometer using the shaking lattice? I assume you optimize based on population splitting, but I assume all atoms get different phase response to the driving lattice. Um, so I would say currently with the shaking lattice technology, it is still in its very beginning phase. Um, so for the shaken lattices, I, I think the operational concept is, um, I mean, there has been publication and work carried out by CU Boulders that um, in terms of the wave package manipulations, um, the atoms can have, you know, pretty nice um, splittings with two H bar K momentums. It is the case where um, higher momentum splitting is always trickier and harder. Um, but I would say as a starting point to have that clean beam splittings in the shaken lattices or with some sort of rag was the, the, the starting point. And uh, I would say it is um, the size of the atoms it's pretty large um, in general compared to um, the period of the, the, the optical populations. So yes, it is true that um, the, the atoms might see slightly different phase response to the, the driving lattices, but it all come down to at the end, um, how big a size we are dealing with. On the larger scale, though, I, I feel the optical potentials, um, it's, um, it's so dense that, um, especially with the core atom, the, the wave package and uh, the de Bois wavelength is so long, so you kind of just sample over. One of the challenging is um, it's less to do with the optical phase, but actually more to do with the atom-atom interactions. It's one of the challenging, I think. Okay, um, I think that's all the time we have today. Uh, we really appreciate everyone that was able to attend this talk by Yingju over atom interferometers. Uh, we look forward to seeing you guys next time. Thanks everyone.